Uh, I, I very much appreciate this notion that is so much a part of Presidio, which is the notion of sustainability. I want to talk about how we're going to get there. This is a tough time throughout the world. And uh, I think that the, the quotation from the Harvard philosopher that talked about the marketplace now really ruling not just the economic sphere, but our social sphere is, in many people's eyes, um, what is happening and is the new reality. But fortunately for the country and fortunately for the world, that is not the reality that is being built by the people who are graduating from Presidio, and it's not the reality of a new generation of under 35-year-olds who are changing the world. And what I want to talk about is first the failure of the institutions uh, that have been spawned over the really the centuries and what's going to replace them. We are in this country at this particular time at a crucial moment. It, the cliched phrase, the perfect storm, I suppose, comes to mind, where we have failure of three of the largest and most important institutions that are vital for any country. We have a failure of the financial institutions of Wall Street, where short-term gain is pursued at the expense of long-term investment into things that create jobs. We have a failure of the media, where what was once educational is now simply shouting at each other for the entertainment of many. And we have a failure of politics, where very little gets done because very little gets talked about in a serious way and there is no willingness to come together. What I often say about my generation, I'm very proud of my generation. Um, my father once told me when he was my age that, and I thought I wasn't listening, of course, like all dutiful sons at that, when I was that age, in my 20s, uh, but I must have, because I tell the story 40 years later. He once said, you know, I have one advantage over you as I grow older. I can look backward as well as forwards. And I, I want to tell you, tell you about that before we get talking about the doom and gloom, because it's important that you try to maintain some perspective as you go out with your degree and start incredible sustainable businesses and do great things to change the world. Because every generation tries to do that. And at the time, it seems like you ne can never get anywhere. But in fact, if you're persistent, you change everything. In 1967 and 1968, I was a freshman in college. 1968 was the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated, that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, that the Chicago Convention blew up. Uh, it was an extraordinarily tumultuous year in America. I had two roommates that year who came from segregated schools in the South who'd never been to school with a white person before. I had never been to school with a black person before. So you can imagine the extraordinary chemistry in that room, and it was an a, a incredibly valuable learning experience, but it was also a painful learning experience, as many learning experiences are. But if you could have asked any of us at that time, by the time we had our 40th anniversary, our 40th reunion, we would have an African-American president of the United States, we would have told you you were crazy. But 40 years later, look how much the country has changed. If you would have said to us, someday in your lifetime, same-sex couples will be married, well, you would have been laughed off the campus and out of the room. But it has changed. So the contribution that our generation has left for you is a great growth in human rights, women's rights, gay rights, civil rights for all kinds of different people. Now, is that finished? No, that work is not finished. It's never finished. Because human beings, part of our intelligence is that we classify, and classification is to stereotype, and stereotype le stereotyping leads to racism. So the work is never done, but the gains are extraordinary. And I look back over that and see our achievements. But in our generation, because of the wars, the, the so-called culture wars that we had over these issues, we focus on the 10% of things that make us different from other people and fight to the death over them, which is why nothing has been done in Congress or the media for the last 30, 20 years. And you look at the 90% of the things that you agree on and figure out how you can make those work. When I was at the Democratic National Committee, I fired all the consultants because they were all, you know, we were paying them a lot of money to tell us how to lose every four years. And 
I hired a 35-year-old African-American pollster who modestly called his polling company Brilliant Corners named Cornell Belcher. And the reason I hired him is because he was the first person I met on the Democratic side who understood that Democrats voted values too, not just Republicans. So I said to him, Cornell, why don't we do some polling among evangelical Christians? Because if you actually look at the words of Jesus, it's called red letter Christianity, just his quotes, fairly close to the Democratic Party platform. So why don't we have a look? So here's what he found, which is so extraordinary. This is the first window I had into your generation and how differently you thought from us. If you poll, this is a 2006 poll. If you polled evangelicals over 55, they were very upset about gay rights and abortion. That was a big thing. If you polled evangelical Christians under 35, the number one issue was poverty, and the number two issue was climate change. And I said, Cornell, why aren't we talking to these people? This is, a pledge, pledge, this is also a page out of the Democratic Party platform. The message that I got from that is that your generation has a much narrower ideological bandwidth than ours does. You don't get the extremes that we had. And that your generation has so much common ground in terms of rebuilding the world and making it a sustainable place that I expect you to succeed where we did not succeed. We did make great advances, and I'm proud of the advances we made, but we are in trouble, and it is time for our generation to yield the mace of leadership to your generation that has to happen now. Our generation wanted to fix the system, to fix the system that sent us to a war where 55,000 people were killed on our, 55,000 Americans were killed to fix the system where people were denied the vote on the basis of their skin color, to fix the system of the horrible inequalities of justice. Some of those things got fixed and some didn't. But your generation isn't going to fix the system because you don't need to fix the system because you can ignore the system. And that is what the internet has done. And it is a wonderful thing because there are ancient institutions, not only 100-year institutions or 300-year institutions, 2,000-year institutions that have become totally out of touch with the people in their membership. So I want to tell you, for those of you who can't remember, and some of you may have never heard this name, about a 23-year-old woman who was a product of a marriage that, where neither parent went to college. She attended a local college in Rhode Island where she grew up. Her name is Molly Catchpole. And last year, some of you may remember in October, the Bank of America decided they were going to charge $5 for every month that somebody had a debit card. And this was very upsetting. This is a strange thing about your culture. I have two millennials in my house. I'm astonished when we go to Starbucks and I pull out $5 for my cup of coffee and they pull out a debit card for their cup of coffee. They pull out a debit card for the 25 cents they're going to use in the parking meter. This is something new. I don't get it. But debit cards are really important to people your age. And they were really important to Molly Cashpole, who was paying $550 a month in student loan repayments. And she didn't want to pay $5 extra for her monthly debit card. So she got online and she went to a website called change.org and change.org knows how to run political campaigns, particularly on the web. And she began a petition drive that ultimately secured one million signatures and caused 100,000 people to withdraw their bank accounts from Bank of America. And 40 days later, the second largest bank in the United States of America rescinded the charge on debit cards. Now, we would have marched on Congress, we would have picketed the Bank of America, the campaign contributions would have flowed into Congress, and we would have been frustrated and nothing would have happened. But corporate America hadn't quite figured it out, so in January of this year, Verizon decided to charge $2 for everybody who wanted to pay their bill online. Now we, of course, we, we were not stupid. We probably would have just said, fine, send it to me a bill by postage and you can pay for that. Which, I mean, this is not a smart business decision. And Molly Cashpole was there again, went to change.org, and this time it took three days to get Verizon to decide that wasn't a very good idea and they weren't going to charge people $2 to pay their bill online anymore. But Molly is not the only person who does these things. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of Molly Cashpoles. There's an outfit called Teach for America. Some of you may have been in it. 
It's not a perfect outfit. They do things that are problematic. But if you go to, for example, Yale University, which is a very good college, it is harder to get into Teach for America than it is to get into law school. These are thousands and thousands of kids all over America who are going into the worst schools in the country. And they don't petition the school boards to fix it, and they don't try to get their politicians to put money into schools. We've been doing that for 40 years, and nothing has happened in inner city education. They start their own charter schools. They run the education system the way they want, with no excuses. They do intensive remediation for kids who have never had a chance. They work with families who need help. And lo and behold, inner city education in America is being changed because people your age have ignored the system and started their own. And that is what your task is as Presidio graduates. Now. This is not all about social do-goodism. You can actually use your MBA to make money, from, even from Presidio. <laughs> I teach at two colleges. One is Hofstra, the other in New York, which is a suburban university in New York, and the other is Yale. And I have a young man in one of my classes who's just graduating this year. He raised a little bit of venture capital money. I say a little bit compared to what the people in Silicon Valley are raising, just not a lot. And his job next year, instead of going to business school, and maybe he'll come to Presidio after he gets done with this, because he could probably use a little training, is to go to Zambia and sell solar-powered chargers for cell phones in small villages with no electricity. Now, not only is he going to make a little money, we hope, if this all goes right, he's going to revolutionize what it is to live in a poor, African or Central American village, and he is going to expand and re global borders. The border of that village will now be expanded to encompass all the kids who had to leave that village because they can't find jobs in rural any place anymore. They have to move to the city. So now their parents still have the connection with those kids because they'll have a cell phone, and they won't. And this is literally what happens. They won't have to walk 20 miles each way once a week to recharge that cell phone. That is also a disruptive technology. There is nothing wrong with making money from disrupting technologies as long as it changes life for the better. And that is an example of what's changing life for the better. This generation is going to be the first generation in Earth to merge the notion of evolution and revolution. I believe that revolution has its downsides. I don't like violence, and I think it does a tremendous amount of painful things to people. And also, those who take power by the sword often end up ruling by the sword. So it turns out perhaps not to be as helpful as it could. Now, our revolution was an exception because it was what we would call a bourgeois re revolution. It was the middle class who were revolting. The Tunisian revolution was an exception. That was also a bourgeois Revolution. We'll see how the Egyptian revolution turns out because the elections are in progress today. But the pace, revolution takes time, it takes years, it takes coordination, it takes arms. Evolution has been the gradually much slower change by gradual improvements. The inventions of Thomas Edison, for example, or Alexander Graham Bell, or even Mark Zuckerberg over a period of time. But as time has proceeded, because of the extraordinary invention of the internet, the time has collapsed so that revolution and evolution are now synonymous. So that the political changes that you are going to have an effect on are not going to revolutionize the Congress. You're simply going to bypass the Congress until they finally get with the program because Congress is more or less irrelevant right now. And you can make the changes in the lives of other people, not just here in San Francisco and in the poor areas, all over the world by doing it your way and simply ignoring the political process. Now. I never, I never advise people your age to, voice, to avoid, ignore the political process because they may not be able to help you very much, but they sure can hurt you. And you better pay attention to politics and you better get out and vote. And since this, I'm sure this is a nonpartisan election, I won't say who I think you should vote for, but... <laughs> <laughs> because as they say in the business, you're not voting for the almighty, you're voting for the alternative, and you should think about that. 
So that's as close as I'm going to get to violating my bipart, my nonpartisan approach that I'm supposed to be having here. <laughs> now, look, we've had a lot of fun with this, and you're going to have a lot of fun. And I love some of the stuff I see on the net because it's snarky and sarcastic, and it's fun while you're changing things. But this is deadly serious. What's at stake here is enormous. The truth is that our generation has recognized for the most part, with the exception of certain members of Congress, that, there, that global warming is a major problem for this country, for this world, and that we have a responsibility to do something about it. And not only do we have a responsibility to do something about it, that if we don't do something about it, the changes that are occurring today are going to be inexorably unstoppable later on. Your generation can do something about that. And you can do the kinds of things, not just marching on Washington and doing all the things we did in the civil rights era and the Vietnam War era. You can get online and you can change things. And even better, you can come up with a business plan. You can come up with a business plan for how to make plugins work. You can come up with a business plan, as a young man in India that I saw recently on the web did, for making sure that they have a shared bike program throughout India. Can you imagine if India were to evolve into a state, not a, a, a nation not like America, where everybody had a 1.2 cars, but where everybody actually used carbon-free transportation? What an enormous impact that would make. So it is an incredibly exciting time to be alive. And you have a tool that's the most extraordinary invention of humankind in terms of personal empowerment since Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press more than 500 years ago. And that is the, the World Wide Web. You're a generation that is not a generation of Americans. This is particularly true of, of Presidio, and I'm particularly proud of Presidio for the diversity of your student body. But this student body represents not just a group of people who want to have a lot of international students here. This student body represents your entire generation, because your generation is not a generation of young Americans. It is a generation of young people from around the world. There is a direct connection for the under 35 year olds that elected Barack Obama in 2008 and the young Egyptians that stood in Tahrir Square until they had a more democratic election, which is being held as we speak to find a new way of ruling this incredibly complex nation of Egypt. What you are doing is overcoming the evils of the globalization. Globalization in itself is not evil, but, but as a result of globalization, Multinational corporations now have more power than most governments. And what the internet allows to happen is to give you the power to be so nimble that you can now move faster, not only than slow governments and slow institutions, you can move faster than multinational corporations and exploit niches that they can't possibly exploit because of your willingness to work hard and your ability to communicate directly with people quickly. I don't probably have to tell you this because I suspect you've spent two years looking at this at Presidio. But the opportunity is, enor is enormous. Most people my age can't grasp, including me, can't quite grasp the enormity of the change that's going to happen as a result of this. The way people talk to each other, the way they treat each other, the way they relate to each other, their inclusiveness. You are building an entire new reality for human beings. It's an extraordinary opportunity. And I, for one, am very proud of you and very happy to help. Thanks so much. <laughs>